It was just after the Second World War when Wilfred Thesiger twice crossed the great desert of Arabia known as the Rab al Khali, or Empty Quarter. Later, he became famous for his travel writing and photography. But there were certain events from this time which he never forgot. I remember on one occasion, we'd caught a hare. We had been a month without meat. We were looking forward enormously to that hare. I looked up and saw three Arabs coming towards us. Seldom, as far as I'm concerned, can guests have been more unwelcome. According to Bedou custom, we fed them on our hair. I felt perfectly murderous. But the Arabs seemed to find the pleasure of their company an adequate compensation for their lost meal. In his 70s, the great traveler decided to settle down at last in northern Kenya, where he was remote from the modern world and close to the tribesmen he admired. As he had no wife or children of his own, he adopted two Samburu boys called Lawi Leboyari and Laputa Lekakwa. When they grew up, he built a house for each of them near the village of Maralal, and after they married, he lived with their families. This was his home for 17 years, and it was where he expected to end his days. But life in Kenya became impossible when Thesiger's own health began to fail and Lawi and Laputa both died from AIDS. So at the age of 90, Sir Wilfred Thesiger, the last of the great explorers, came to live in a suburban nursing home in England. That's where I went to visit him. Hello, I'm Wilfred. Hi. Hi. Um, I'll just get your medication to put in a little bottle oh. that you take after lunch at 2 o'clock. So if I just bring it up now and give it to Sir Wilfred and... Make him responsible. Oh, did you hear what he says? I make you responsible. What's his name? You're saying he. What's what's the gentleman's name? John. John. Right, I'll just go and get it and bring it up then. He didn't complain or regret the loss of his African household, but Thesiger never wanted to settle in England. He first came to this country from the British legation in Ethiopia as a nine-year-old boy. And that's when his happy childhood ended. His father died just when he needed him most, and at prep school he was mocked for his stories of hunting expeditions and warriors with spears in the wild land where he was born. Thank you very much. Do you have wobbly dish from... I can't even do that properly any longer. That's remarkably steady. It's... Thank you very much. He couldn't read newspapers any longer because of Parkinson's disease and failing eyesight, but he listened to what he called the wireless and took a special interest in the news from places he had explored in the past. Yemen, for instance, where the Bin Laden family came from, and Afghanistan, where Osama Bin Laden was hiding in the mountains. I didn't meet Bin Laden, but I knew very well. What time have they got him? No. Pursue them if you like, use your own sort of underground people to do it. But to go, go in bombing and bombing and bombing because you're looking for the, the terrorists. Yes. Well, they're they are. only making thousands more. No. The most effective thing he could do, and I wonder whether it hadn't occurred to him, he gets, he goes off somewhere, he takes with him a um, couple of people and he commits suicide. He can go on haunting America for the rest of the time. Why I wonder does he, does he have this particular hatred of America? It represents the modern world, which is what he's rejecting. Of course, Thesiger also rejected the modern world, not with violence, but by always traveling away from it and seeking to be with people whose traditions were still intact. That's what brought him to live with the Arabs of the marshes in southern Iraq during the 1950s, long before the era of Saddam Hussein. The current president, George Bush, is determined to topple Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Well, 
Saddam Hussein is also a bloody person. Yes, but he did in his own country. If Saddam Hussein was going off and doing this in America, then, then it would be perfectly fair for them to do it. If they get then they're successfully and destroyed the weapons, doesn't mean that this that they cause such bitter, bitter hatred. The one thing that the Arabs of that part of the world is, is, is to down America or to harm America. What I like are these sort of portraits. He's not posed and that sitting there suddenly he's looking at me like that as a friend. photograph, count the number of flies on his face. Do you see them? Yes, I do. Scores of them. How many of them have done that? Astonishing photograph. What I have got, at any rate, is a sense of composition. I can see what will make a photograph. I instantly saw that that group there was a photograph. Yes. Thesiger the photographer came before Thesiger the writer. He kept journals of all his travels, but it was ten years before he was persuaded to try and write a book, chiefly by his mother. My mother, she was always saying, you must write a book, and I said, I'm not going to write a book. Wouldn't be able to do it anyway. I haven't got a clue how you write a book. But her nagging worked. He finally went away into seclusion in Denmark and wrote Arabian Sands. It was the first of many. Arabian Sands and Marsh Arabs, like my choice visions of a nomad. I think the best of them is Arabian Sands. Do you? Or you perhaps haven't read the other many of the others? Mm, I have, I've read most of them. And yes, I think perhaps Arabian Sands is the best. The cloud gathers. The rain falls and men live. The cloud disperses without rain and men and animals die. In the deserts of southern Arabia, there is no rhythm of the seasons, no rise and fall of sap, but empty wastes where only the changing temperature marks the passage of the years. It is a bitter, desiccated land, which knows nothing of gentleness or ease. Yet men have lived here since earliest times. Passing generations have left fire-blackened stones at camping sites, a few faint tracks polished on the gravel plains. Elsewhere, the winds wipe out their footprints. During the war, Thesiger had fought with the partisans against the Italians in Ethiopia and then with the SAS in North Africa. So he was already a battle and desert-hardened man when he aimed for Arabia. He had picked up Arabic years before in Sudan and improved it in Syria. All he needed was a means to go there. A research project on desert locusts gave it to him. It was 1946 when he set out to cross the empty quarter by a much more difficult route than either Thomas or Philby had taken before him. The distances were vast, the state of the wells and vital grazing for the camels unknown even to his guides, and all around the tribes were raiding and fighting one another. Here, Thesiger could really test his mettle. It was the sort of challenge of the desert which lured me there, and I felt that would be 
mitten av det som är pretty difficult. I hadn't realized the most difficult thing of all would be to try and live up to the standards of behavior and civilization, if you like the word that my companions had. Their standards of honesty and loyalty and courage and endurance and patience and so on. They, they matched me all down the line. His favorite companions were two young men of the Rashid tribe, Salim bin Kabina and Salim bin Gabesha. They were friends, about 16 years old, and both from very poor Bedou families. When Thesiger met them, neither one owned a working rifle or a single camel. The Englishman became their benefactor, but he shared their hard life so willingly that a special bond of loyalty grew between them. I mean, you were saying earlier that, that your great good fortune was to be born when I was in Arabia when the old virtues, the old life and the old virtues... Yes, and I saw that and I lived with it and I know what it represented. I know what it meant to... With my story of the hair is the one I... which you probably remember. Oh, Remind we, me. We'd... Um, been, we, we, we were on one of these journeys. We hadn't been killing gazelle or anything because we were desperately short of water. I mean, we saw the water in these skin bags in which we had it dripping. And I described how I used to watch it drip, drip, dripping into the sand as he went along, like blood from an unquenched wound. And then we approached this place where there was, we knew there was a well and there was a hare there and so we killed the hare in Kabina and Bin Rubesh and we were discussing how, they, how they'd cook it. Bin Kabina wanted to grill it and Bin Rubesh said no nonsense we're going to make soup and we'll see what soup. Long I'm just I was they were talking about it and Bin Kabina was cooking it and I said is it ready yet? He said, no, not quite. He looked up and said, oh, my God. And they're coming towards us, three Arabs. So we stood up and we made them welcome. We said, God has brought them and all the rest of the eventual greetings. And then we sat them down. And they thereby become our guests. And Binkabina got up and took this stew and the rice which we'd cooked with the water which we had, which we'd got from the well, and set it down in front of these three people and said, now eat at the front of And they said, join us. And the others said, no, 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 indeed, you're our guest, the front of So you had to do without and go on starving? Yes, I felt quite murderous. <laughs> but that and my reaction because I had not, not grown up tested all through my life by these very, really, very really harsh conditions. I'd responded differently if I'd grown up as a Bedou boy. Far from growing up like Bin Kabina and Bin Gabesha, at their age, Thesiger had been a college boy at Eton. He was happy there. In fact, the public school, being an all male, and semi-tribal society with a strong code of loyalty bore some similarity to Bedou life. But as the hair story shows, when Thesiger was tested to the limit, the Bedou easily outclassed him, and the rigor of their desert customs earned his profound respect. The Bedou were that much more high standard. They held to more to be admired and the sort of town Arabs especially. And then it becomes a question of, of who can make the most money. We met a man in Abu Dhabi and he was completely, looked completely penniless. I said to Pinkabino, no, what's wrong with you? 
He was once one, easily one of the richest men in our tribe, but he gave it all, and he spoke with tremendous admiration of this man. He gave it all away. He required a sort of an immortal, new, lasting name for generosity. Yes. He looked, looked absolutely destitute. Well, that you're not going to meet that here in England or anywhere. You're not going to meet that in America, certainly not. Somebody who's absolutely humbled. <laughs> okay, uh, no, you probably aren't. You no, know, it's, it's a completely different upside. The whole thing's upside down. Yes, but it's also... Our admiration is, ah, that man is, he started with nothing, and now look at him, he owns this and this. This and this. Our admiration goes that way. That goes with genuine character, the man's character. Yes, but he must be an, a, a, an astonishing exception now, there. If well, I say, if you're talking about now, I'm not. I'm talking about the time when they hadn't got Binkabin and Bin Obey, had never seen a car. I think that we saw Philby's car on one occasion, and that was the first time they had ever seen a car. The discovery of oil in Arabia was the biggest disaster that could happen to any country. Ruined them. Being Cabin and Bin Rapesha get my aeroplane. Three days later, I'm giving a food in that where we had it today. But they're a good example. Have their uh, moral standards disintegrated? Oh, I'm sure they have. They, they're thinking in terms of money and everything else. This seemed a harsh judgment to me. Sir Wilfrid had a private income and could do as he pleased, whereas Bin Kabina and Bin Gabesha had to accept the changes which oil wealth brought to Arabia, and by and large it brought them peace and prosperity. But Sir Wilfrid couldn't accept this and held to his own fierce creed. The harder the life, the finer the type, and there's no doubt about that. The easier you make life, the lower goes your standard. The world has now been diminished so completely. Diminished in scale? Well, in every sense. I mean, there's no variety anywhere go off to the Congo and you'll find in the forest, what was it, somebody went there the other day and found an advertisement for a Coca-Cola. And if as our civilizations go on with our cars and airplanes and factories and everything, we should go on producing this this gas because no, no orders about it will stop it. There we are, we've had it. My own guess, my own certainty is that there'll be no human beings in the, in the world in less than a hundred years we should be extinct as a species.
An Arabian nightmare is what Thesiger called this place as early as 1977. He would only find it worse now, along with all the other modern Arab cities built with oil wealth. But the Bedou tribesmen, who Thesiger so admired, feel differently. Indeed, many have moved hundreds of miles to live here. His old friends, the Rashid, for example, whose black tents dotted the desert on the southern edge of the empty quarter, even in the 1990s. Now they dwell amid the suburbs which sprawl out more than 30 kilometers from downtown Abu Dhabi in air-conditioned concrete villas. For anyone who has read Arabian Sands, this seems a strange place to find Thesiger's old companions, Selim bin Kabina and Selim bin Gabesha, but it is inevitable. All the advantages are now in the city, not in the old nomadic life. Here they can claim free houses, receive a pension, and help their children adapt to modern life through education. Above all, they can fulfill an age-old Arab ambition and sustain a large family, something which Thesiger ignored when passing judgment on their moral decline. Bin Kabina has two wives, two sons, four daughters, and 44 grandchildren. Bin Gabesha has one wife, four sons, 10 daughters, and 36 grandchildren. The two old sheikhs remember Thesiger well and still admire his courage, but they would not talk about him on film. This was not a question of money, as Thesiger might have thought. I offered money to a son and a grandson who helped me, and they declined it out of Bedou pride. The old standards are alive to that extent, even in a soft new life, cushioned while it lasts by oil wealth. The tragedy, which Thesiger felt in his own special way, is this. A sustainable way of life, which lasted for thousands of years, has vanished just in a couple of decades to be replaced by an unsustainable one. The people are not to blame for this, but modern industrial society itself. And the empty quarter? It's that bit emptier than it was before. <laughs>